Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, what I hope is a, a very good discussion on the next generation of live music players. Um, very excited that we have uh, such a diversity of panelists here, uh, ranging from uh, you know what's next in social media to all sorts of uh, data pertaining to artists and tours. Um, before we get started, uh, the the partner for our panel, and in fact for this whole day, is uh, Polestar. And um, I think it would be good if we gave Polestar just a couple of moments uh, to share a little bit more about what Polestar is doing. Uh, Bridge runs the UK office for Polestar, so Bridge, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you. Thanks yeah. very much. Cheers. Yeah, I'll just... Uh just going to show you a few things um, about Polestar because I don't know if, if everybody in the room knows you know, what, what it is or what we do. So just to get an idea now, like um, how, how many um, artists do we have in the room? Like a show of hands. Okay. Um, and then like, uh, like labels, how many labels in the room? Okay. Um, uh, publishing companies? No. Okay. Uh, like booking agents? Cool. Promoters, okay, and any venues here? Okay, so quite quite a good spread, you know. So um, what we do at Polestar, I know uh, two things mainly. One, we've got like uh, the contacts for the whole industry, and um, which you can see here, which could be useful to to all of you, and that's really contacts for um, uh, publishing companies and their, their artists, record companies and their artists, booking agents, their artists, artist management companies and their artists, and uh, then like promoters, venues, festivals as well. Okay, so if, if we wanted to show you just kind of how, how that works, so for example, if you wanted to go to London here, and then here you can just literally pick whatever you wanted to. So. For any of you guys that are kind of starting out or wanting to make contact with people, Polestar's been going for 35 years and it's just a nice way to get um, the kind of correct information for the industry. So for example here, I'm just going to click on like artist management companies here and it will load up one of 162 management companies. So you can all see, you know, you literally just click on any management company and it will bring up the roster of artists and uh, contact details as well. So it's just quite a good way to kind of, you know, get that information direct. And if you guys want to, you know, up, uh, upload your information to Polestar, it's free to do so. It doesn't cost anything, but then you're on the kind of global platform. So um, you just have to go to this update forms here and whatever you are, like a management booking agency, uh, record company, music publishing company, label, you just add your company on there and then your, your roster of clients as well. So that's kind of like the contact side of Polestar. And then we have, um, we've also been like reporting on the live music industry for about 35 years uh, for artists. So as an example, if I put like uh, Ed Sheeran in here, that's a good example. This is the kind of information you'd see uh, on him. So at the top, you've got like uh, how many headline shows he's done, um, how many tickets he's sold um, on average, you know, about 29,000. He's grossing about 2.2 million per show. If you wanted to book him for your, your birthday party or anything, you'd probably have to pay about half of that, you know, about one, roughly, more or less. But it gives you some indication of what the art, artist is worth in the um, global touring industry and how much you should be paying, not to overpay or underpay. But it's a rough idea. So they've got all the up-and-coming dates given to us by the promoters directly, all the uh, past dates. And uh, the, my favorite bit here, is the contact. So you've got his agent, his record company, his management. Um, again, if you click on the record company, you can see which other artists that they are looking after as well. But if for the art artists in the room, you know, if you guys wanted to add yourselves um, onto Polestar, it doesn't, again, it's completely free, but then managers, agents, uh, record companies, publishing companies know who you are and they can find you uh, on Polestar, you know? So that's the roster there for that record company, so you can see there. So we do something called the live box office uh, da database as well, which is here. And that will basically, you know, the show's going on every day in, you know, countries around the whole world. So Polestar is really the only place you can just find out, you know, which is the artist, which venue they're playing at, how many tickets they sold in that show, 
how much money the show made. And it just kind of gives you some kind of background on the artist, because without that information, you're guessing a lot, you know? So it just, it does kind of help everybody and makes it a lot more transparent. So um, if you want to, if you are an artist, you want to add your shows, you literally um, would go onto our, our homepage. You just literally got to uh, go to the bottom here. You, you add your event before the show. And then after the show, you add the box office and you can put your figures in. And then it will appear on Polestar. We've got like a weekly magazine. It will be uh, in there as well. And um, yeah, we do like a, the Global Concert Pulse, which is like the highest grossing artist in the industry right now. So um, you know, it's only kind of here that you can find that information. You know, for example, like Justin Timberlake, number one, tells you how much money he made, and how much uh, tickets he's selling. So that's kind of what, what we are really, just like all the, the contacts for the industry. Uh, and you know the, the ticket sales and um, the gross for, for shows that you're doing you know so as the the live industry and the recorded stuff you know there is a crossover there knowing how well an artist big or small is doing um, on the live circuit can kind of help to understand where you know their potential on, on maybe album sales and and recorded sales uh, as well you know so I think that's why we're glad to be part of Medem to kind of just try and cross over between the two uh, of live and recorded. I could show you more, but uh, you know I think we've got we, we've got time to uh, see, speak to everybody else as well. So, but come and see me afterwards. We're in the USA Pavilion if you do want to have a chat. And there is a Medem subscription uh, offer as well. You know, so if you guys want to know more, you just go to subscribe and then put Medem at the end, and you get a reduced price uh, to use it. Cool. Thanks. No worries. Thanks, Bridge. And for those of you that were concerned you may not find value in today's session, you already know uh, how to book at Sheeran for your birthday party. So there you go. Um, so uh, let's jump right into things. I think um, by, by way of introduction uh, or introductions, um, I would ask each of you, and Morgan, I'll start with you, um, to, to speak, if you would, just briefly uh, about um, your company and how it fits currently into what you think is uh, a trend in the space of technology and, and the touring industry. Uh, yeah, so I'm the, I'm the founder and the CEO of Wiker, and Wiker is uh, uh, the first social app for live music lovers. So we developed the first social algorithm uh, to match music events with music profile of users and of their friends. Yes, um, and um, so we think live music is first a social experience. So we share the same moment with thousands of people. And that's why we think the, the social is a, is a big trend for live music. Um, and that's why we develop Wiker. So we have right now uh, 50,000 users in three months on the app. Uh, first of all, we are in France, like you can hear with my accent, so I'm <laughs> French. Uh, and we have a great look on United States, uh, because this is a core uh, of live music with 45% of the new of, the, of, the, um, of this market. So yes, yeah, so we are concentrated on the social part of live. A uh, lot of people going live, 5% uh, of growth each year for this market, and people want to leave more and more experiences to share. So that's why we connect people through, through this way. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And Louis? Hi guys, uh, so I'm the uh, UK country manager for um, Arena Metrics. Uh, Arena Metrics is a, is a data analytics uh, and marketing platform um, that helps event organizers and, um, and uh, cultural organizations to efficiently use all their data um, to build loyalty, uh, build loyalty, um, sell more tickets basically and, and reach uh, new audiences. So we found that uh, live event organizers have accumulated a lot of tools over the years and they don't have one centralized CRM uh, platforms connecting to all their marketing uh, uh, tools and that's why we, uh, that's why we build, build this platform. And you're, I mean, it's really a, a data 
Yeah, it's a it's a data platform. So our main source uh, of data is um, comes from ticketing service providers uh, who we build a partnership with, and then we try, um, depending on the vertical, to bring as much data as possible and to present it in, a, in an efficient manner uh, with dashboards and such um, on the on the on our tool. Okay, and um, Bridge, I'm going to skip over you. Um, yes, I, want, I want it to go again. You know, but yeah. so that, so <laughs> and uh, Yelmer, uh, please. Yeah, um, so I've been the founder of uh, Run Trap Events. I started out as a promoter, um, doing that for five years now. Um, and also running a booking agency. Um, and for me, um, what I found is a lot of hassle um, in the booking process, uh, finding the right artist, uh, contacting or finding the contacts of the agent or manager. Um, and yeah, sometimes you know you go back and forth for three months uh, emailing back and forth, maybe 100 emails in total, and then in the end, uh, the artist cancels because uh, he, d he wants to be on the top of the billing, for instance, and not sharing it with uh, somebody else. Um, so because of that, I st founded a simple book. Uh, it's not on here, but uh, it's a startup for an independent booking platform um, where you can see uh, immediately if an artist is available, um, do an inquiry, um, and just smoothen basically the whole booking process, but also for the agent side to, um, you know, any uh, left out dates that you need to fill, um, just send and push out to all the promoters in that specific area that might be interested for such an artist. So I guess I would start off, and by the way, I'm gonna leave a good uh, five or 10 minutes for questions at the end too. I know that there's a, a good percentage of artists in the audience and you guys may have your own particular questions, so please uh, be ready to, to have those. Um, one of the things that I wanted to start off asking about, just because it's very much in the news cycle, is uh, security um, and, and uh, data security, customer security. Um, you know, in America, uh, as many of you may know, TicketFly was allegedly hacked. Um, you know, so I have a two-part question, I guess. One is, um, you know, how do each of you, to the extent that you are thinking about it, how do you think about security? Uh, is it possible to really, truly have security? Uh, and then I'm just interested from a moral perspective, the reporting was that TicketFly, uh, the hackers basically said, you know, give us a Bitcoin and we will not cause any problems. Uh, a Bitcoin's market value is about $7,500, uh, which is, in the scheme of things, I mean, there's probably someone uh, who spent $7,500 on a dinner last night here in Cannes. Um, and yet, the, you know, be, for lack of paying that, uh, you know, probably like 20, 30 percent of the U.S. touring business was disrupted uh, for, for several days. They couldn't get ticket counts. They couldn't sell tickets. It was a, it was a nightmare. Uh, so I'm just curious for your thoughts on, on these things. Um, Maybe Louis, I'll, you, you know, you're a you're a data company. You have a lot of sensitive data. Uh, maybe I'd start with you. Yeah. So um, we've all received these annoying uh, these annoying emails recently. Um, GDPR emails uh, telling you that you can opt uh, opt out of their database. Uh, we put a huge stress on that because, as I said, we have a lot of sources of data. So we make sure we sign the NDAs with the right people. So with our clients and with our partners. Uh, then further than that, uh, GDPR gives you directives when things go wrong. So there's a whole process to follow. Uh, you have to notify the right people at the right time in a, spe in a specific time frame. So um, we, so the ticket sellers are doing pretty well on that front, especially the biggest one, uh, the biggest ones in in, in France. They're uh, they're pretty. Uh, they've been they've been following the news very closely. Uh, the problem comes uh, with um, with the with our clients. So they can be um, they could be festivals, uh, they could be theaters, concert halls, and such. And it's there. It's very much their data. It's, it it belongs to them. But they they're not very mature. Uh, I'd say on the subject. So our customer success team, for example, has put a huge stress on that to accompany them uh, and make sure that um, they follow the right procedures at the right time. Because I mean, um, because soon. Um, yeah, because soon they're going to have to comply absolutely, and they not—they're not necessarily uh, 
technologically inclined so far uh, to follow all these procedures and so yeah and so that's been internally that's been a huge subject for us obviously uh, because we're dealing with other people's data and um, and yeah and we try also to, to, to spread the word as much as we can to uh, to the people who are not uh, as mature yeah. and from an ethical perspective if someone came to you and said give me seventy five hundred dollars and I'll leave your reputation and your infrastructure intact well they would have to hack us first but so let's say that's happened. Would you would you pay the seventy five hundred dollars, or from an ethical perspective, do you not do it? Uh, that decision wouldn't necessarily come to me. But um, from an ethical perspective, seventy five. How much? Seventy five hundred dollars <laughs> U.S. Um, probably not. I think um, I think we tr we do everything to avoid that. Um, uh, we work with the right authorities to yeah. avoid giving into any of that. But. Um, so does anyone have, a, have a, a differing point of view, or do you all agree with that? Well, um, I do agree with it. Um, normally what you have, for instance, with it, when you're dealing with an ethical hacker, um, they would give you a notice uh, first without revealing it to the public, um, and then they would probably let you try uh, with your tech team to uh, solve the issue, solve the bug. Um, and in case that doesn't happen, then uh, yeah, it would get revealed. And usually, you know, they get a reward for finding the issue. Yeah. So um, I think in a sense, it's a good way uh, always to, if there are any bugs or any issues, um, to, to find them and be aware of them. Um, it just really depends on how they're dealing with it. Okay. So each of you represent different slices of, of technology as it relates to the live space. And what I'd like to do is just get a quick sense um, from each of you about what is the greatest sort of value that you can provide right now with your current technologies to, let's say, let's direct it to the artist community. Um, and then wh where is it going, right? Like 12 months from now, 36 months from now, where do you see uh, the greatest potential in the in the parts of the industry where you're working, and what needs to happen in order to realize that potential? So you know, at Waker we provide music events that match your music profile and your friends. So we are social, so we help artists to um, improve their ticket sales. So that's why we created Waker first. Uh, Forty percent of ticket sales are unsold each year. So that's why we created this social way to improve the the. The number so you of embed tickets a, you, you buy. You embed a ticket selling experience yes. into Wiker. Yes. So while folks are interacting with each other or sharing recommendations. Exactly. So for example, you can see, oh, OK, I match with uh, my friend on this concert, so I will buy two tickets and not just one or three. Uh, so this is the way. Um, so for the trend for the next 12 months, for next year, I think Wiker will be more social, um, so that's why we launch a chat uh, the next week to connect people even more um, on this social way and to connect people. Just we connect people through the passion of live music. Um, so yes, yeah, that's why I think this is a big trend for the last month. What does that mean, more social? Like for people that don't yes. know the Wiker app, <laughs> what, I mean, what does that actually translate to? Yeah, so we are more social than other apps for just concert recommendations. So because we believe concerts and festivals are, are just um, things we share with other people. So we think just have a concert recommendation, um, it's to it's too bad to be to have a user experience. So we are very concentrated on the user experience around live music. So that's why we are social. That's why we launch a chat. That's why we will launch a lot of features about augmented reality. Also, geolocated chat on festivals. So imagine you are in a big festival, for example, in Rock en Seine in, in France. Uh, you are geolocated at this place, and you launch Wiker, and you can see all people around you. You can chat with them. You can do a lot of meeting with with, them, with those people. Okay. Yes. Um, Louis, from a data perspective, I mean, we you can't go to any sort of tech conference or music conference without talking about data and big data. Um, what are, what are you seeing as the trends in data, and you know how will your business be different 
a year or two from now? So um, our our main objective is actually a twofold. On the side of the uh, event organizers, we want to simplify their lives. We want to uh, we want to save help them save time on uh, time-consuming tasks and automate some of the processes that um, they would they would be uh, they would. I mean, I don't know, run Excels for and, and such. So uh, we try to put in place these tools. To, uh, we try to put in place these tools using making the most of the data and automating tasks. And, and, and just so for people who may not understand, yeah. a lot of your data use it really centers around sort of predictive buying. You help promoters understand, uh, you know, oh, there's, you know, this person who traditionally buys, you know, four tickets every mm -hmm. year, they've only bought two, so that's a good person to market to, or things like exactly. that. Exactly, so so that's a, that's another point, basically. Um, on the side of the, of the client, basically, we, our objective is also to send better quality content. So uh, we're gonna identify specific patterns, uh, we're gonna accumulate, basically when we work with a client, we're going to try to get their, data, their, their past data from, I mean, for example, if we're working for a festivals, we're going to try to get as much data as we can from the past and sort of use that uh, for our uh, forecasting tool um, in arena metrics uh, and make the most of that. And yeah, and basically we're not afraid to say we try to send better quality content so that they're uh, maybe more uh, likely to, to, to buy a specific event and also uh, less likely to, uh, to opt out of uh, email. Right, you're using data to sort of identify what type of content a customer might be, be most likely to be responsive to. Uh, yeah, so practically yeah. it would be, for example, uh, identify the musical preference of a specific audience, uh, the profile of a specific audience. Something that we do, for example, is identify families and maybe send them offers uh, that way. Um, uh, yeah, musical preferences also, we look at age. I mean, it's highly customizable. Mm -hmm. So depending on the, the vertical that we're working with, um, we can just um, very finely target uh, the people that we're actually trying to reach. And what and would that you, has a lot of value for event organizers. What would you say is the is sort of the governing dynamic of, of trend in your space now? Like, what will change in the next 12 months, the next 36 months that will, you know, sort of change the opportunities that you have? Well, these, these days we're very busy with, uh, with security, as we, as we touched upon uh, earlier. Um, I've talked so to, I don't know if this affects you at all, but I was talking to a friend who works yeah. at a different data business, mm -hmm. a marketing business in the States, and he was saying that uh, his job has gotten tougher late, lately mm -hmm. uh, because with all the problems that Facebook has had around security, uh, Facebook is constantly sending out messages now uh, prompting people to consider updating their uh, security profiles. Uh, their privacy profiles, and people generally, every time they send out one of those messages, fewer and fewer people are sharing that data. Um, is this a, a trend that you're aware of? Well, that's um, that's something we're uh, we're pretty concerned with because, um, as I said, we've integrated marketing tools, so we use Facebook Business directly uh, within our tool, and we try to establish um, uh, Facebook lookalike uh, profiles so we can. Base, so event organizers can uh, better spend their marketing budget on uh, on, on uh, Facebook ads, basically. So that's something that we're definitely looking at, and we try to reassure um, we try to reassure our clients that nothing will be lost uh, in the process. And and sometimes it's it's hard to convince, but we tell them that we take like all the precautions necessary uh, for that to happen. So. Mm -hmm. um, Bridge, w what trend is affecting or shaping your business now? Um, well, I think, you know, we're, we're really about the global touring uh, industry, and I think, I mean, some of the issues we have are some of the um, uh, can developing countries which are, you know, they've got music there, but they want to attract more live touring artists to come to those countries, so it's trying to work out getting people, like even artists or promoters or uh, agents, whoever, in each country, venues to add their information, then everybody knows who they are, and if they want to put a show on in that country, they know who to contact. So I think um, it would be great to kind of have more people uh, adding themselves. Um, so, so for you, really it's really globalization, right? It, like it's an increasingly global business. You want to be the database that provides all of that global yeah, information. Just so people can really speak to each other and they know, you know, if you go to any country who's a good promoter or a good agent, and especially for the artists that want to break out from their country and play um, abroad and go on the, the global touring circuit, 
Um, it's just a way that they can, people can see who they are and what's going on with them and how to make contact and, you know, try and encourage more these artists that people are here, you know, to play globally and uh, give them the, the tools that they need to, to be seen, and, you know, so. And can I ask, has, has, I don't know if you would be the person to ask this question of, but has Polestar ever considered providing like contextual information about the individuals? So in other words, I can go online and I can see, uh, oh, this is the promoter for this act but I can't see necessarily, like it would almost be fascinating if you turn that into like the Yelp of people, right? Where like I could be like, oh wow, this is the promoter for this act, and seven people say he has screwed someone. Like, we could look into that. That yeah. could be quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, I'll speak I'm sure no one has screwed anyone in the live music business, but you know the point. It's, uh, yeah. No, let me look into that. I'll come back to you and uh, give me some time. That's a fair answer. Yelmer, uh, what, what trend are you paying attention to that is, uh, is shaping your business in terms of where it's all going in the next couple of years? Um, yeah, actually about uh, what you just said earlier, um, we're also working on um, a sort of a review system. So for each booking or placement that you did, yeah. um, you could rate uh, the artist and give any information about the show. Um, I actually love this, by the way. I mean, I have to say, like, I can, I can find reviews online about doctors. I can find reviews online about all sorts of professions. So it seems like it might make some sense, especially in an industry where frequently, like, relatively new artists are emerging into the space. They don't know who to trust. They don't know who to work with. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we're becoming more global, especially with touring. Um, you know, for instance, last week I had an artist of my agency. Um, he's supposed to be playing in China, and we already received 50% of the payment, and now they said the, the festival got canceled. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really good that, that you have this uh, information. Um, I think, in general, uh, about uh, the music industry, um, we're lacking behind on um, tech and innovation. Uh, especially compared to to other industries, um, and in terms of simple book, um, well, we're we're still in beta. Um, we're looking for investment, by the way. Um, but um, I think the main key points are um, to um, get more bookings for uh, for the agent and the artist, um, and also um, to sort of take away the uh, asymmetric uh, information that you have currently in the the music industry in terms of uh, booking. So one last question, um, Morgan, this is for you. Um, you know, we're in this uh, interesting and, and a desperately needed moment in the, in the music industry and I think in the world where, um, you know, you have the Me Too movement uh, that is still going on, um, changing behaviors, changing levels of awareness. Um, you're a woman not only in the music business, but also a woman in tech, which yes. has had its own <laughs> enormous and documented limitations on the success of women there um, and the volume of women there. So you're sort of a, at this interesting crossroads as a woman in both tech and the music industry. Um, how have you seen these things evolve? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'm a geek, first of all. So <laughs> that's that's why I created Wiker because I'm a geek and I'm a music lover. Yeah. So yes, I'm different about um, several women. So yes, I love technologies. I love music and um, yeah. So like yes, I saw a lot of women like this. Yes, but. I think uh, this is a question of generation. Um, I'm 27 years old, and in my generation, I don't see a lot of sexism or anything like that. I think it's on the old generation, mm. and I'm, I think our generation is changing the world uh, in few ways, like innovation, like how we want, how we have to see the world. And yeah, so it's a, it's a good way for me. So I don't feel uh, any sexism right now at the medium, no problem. Um, I think people are changing uh, the way they're thinking, that, okay, it's a woman, so why she is here? So no, there's no problem for me. <laughs> good, I'm glad to hear that. I hope, uh, I hope many, many women are having the same experience. Thank you for having me on this stage. So this is a good example to have women in music and tech. Good. Very good. I want to thank uh, our panelists, certainly, if we can give them a round of applause. <laughs> and I want to thank you guys all for coming. So have a fantastic Medem, and uh, thank you all very much. Take care. Thank, Thank you, you Bill. <laughs>